Hi, it's great to be in Athens, but I'm actually here to take you someplace else today. I'm going to take you to entrepreneur country. Entrepreneur country is that place where every entrepreneur goes every day. They go to talk to other entrepreneurs about what it means to run their business, the near-death experiences through to the breakthrough moments. But it's also that future vision of how the world will work. As Wayne Gretzky said, not where the puck is, but where the puck is going. And I decided to roll that future back to the present, and I wrote a book, which was published last year, called Welcome to Entrepreneur Country. And I'm super pleased that it's been published here in Greece by Economia Publications. I'm coming back to Athens next week for the book launch. But Entrepreneur Country is actually going global. We're issuing an invitation globally to go to Entrepreneur Country. Now, why does that matter? Why should you care? Well, I was born and raised close to Palo Alto, California. And if I have a bias, it should be Palo Alto. And what Palo Alto, California does exceptionally well is it consistently and systematically builds global leading firms, game changers, headquartered in Palo Alto. And it says the following. It says, if you're a Delaware corporation, if your financial accounts are done in U.S. GAAP, If your angel investors went to Stanford, if you know where the university cafe is, then we know how to engage with you. We know how to deal with you. But God forbid you're from Odessa or Cairo or Namibia, because then you are unstructured data. And the best that you can really do is to get yourself to Palo Alto. But that doesn't map to the reality that I know. I've worked with great entrepreneurs from all over the world. More than 10 years ago, I started working with an obscure Swedish entrepreneur called Nicholas Enström. He was building a base in Estonia, which later became Skype, and they transformed the telecoms world. And Roman Stanek, who's one of my shareholders, is one of the Czech Republic's leading entrepreneurs. He's on his third successful company. So it's true that great entrepreneurs can come from anywhere on earth, from any corner of the planet. But it's also true that they're not systematically and consistently building global leading firms, game changers, headquartered from any place on the planet. What's needed is a way to take Palo Alto to the world, to reduce the cost of discovery of corporates to startups, to reduce the cost of disruption of startups to corporates thereby exploding the market, democratizing access. And that's the purpose and the mission and the proposition that Entrepreneur Country has taken upon ourselves to bring to the world. But really, for me, it just really starts with the face of this little guy. Because I have to admit that that's my face too. And I never forget that it's the face of every one of those 100 entrepreneurs that comes to see us at Ariadne Capital my investment firm. The more you tell him or her that they can't do something, the more they're going to show you that they can. And here I'm going to give you two good reasons why you should care about that little face. Because that entrepreneur, by virtue of their talent or their expertise or their background or their upbringing, or it might just be the chip on their shoulder, they see what's inevitable. They see the future. But a lot of people have visions of the future. The second reason is actually much more important. That entrepreneur is willing to live abnormal lives to bring that future to the reality. All of society benefits, not just because they see the inevitable, but because they're willing to live an abnormal life. Now, there's a lot of people that think that money is the most important element of the toolkit. A lot of people in Palo Alto and a lot of people around the world. They think if you don't have any money, there's no way you can build a great company. But if we step back and we put a historical perspective on it, money doesn't start the party. Capital follows ideas. It always has and it always will. Christopher Columbus was the guy who discovered the new world. Queen Isabella just had an upside in the outcome. Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel. 
the Medici family had an upside in the outcome. The money's job is to find the men and the women who are building the future, who understand what's inevitable and are working day in, day out, living that abnormal life to bring it to the future. Capital follows ideas. It always has, it always will. And the financial services industry is not an industry. It's a service industry to industry. So remember the new economy? Turns out it's only the latest version of new. If we continue our historical perspective and look at Carlotta Perez, a Venezuelan economist, who very helpfully looked at the past 300 years, and she found remarkably that every 60 to 70 years, the same thing happens. There's a disruptive technology that gets, over the course of 60 to 70 years, an arc of transformational capacity and a new common sense emerges. She finds that it's absolutely repetitive. You have this big bang of disruptive technology, a whole series of new technologies installed, a turning point, a financial crisis, and by the end of the 60 or 70 years, a new order of living has emerged. And what's really important is that the faster society embraces the new common sense, the better it is for society. You wait late, a couple of people get wealthy. You go early and society blossoms. Prosperity ensues. The pie expands and growth in the economy happens. So there you were in Santa Clara in 1971, not too far from Palo Alto, and the Intel microprocessor absolutely explodes into the universe. And you see a whole bunch of companies there that were derivative. They couldn't have happened unless the Intel microprocessor, that disruptive force, had happened. And then we went through the turning point. Remember that financial crisis? That's the turning point. But the important thing is the way you get out of the turning point and get into that second half of the cycle is that society embraces the change. Well, the revolution starts as a small fact. Not everybody in Palo Alto or Santa Clara understood what was going on in 1971, but it has a big promise and it moves to become a significant, inevitable, unavoidable force in the market. The waves of technology and economic institutional change just continue to roll through our lives until that new common sense emerges. Well, I hear you say that's kind of like what happened with the dot-com thing, kind of late 1990s, you know, every David with his slingshot was going to take on the establishment. Didn't really work, did it? But that's not what I'm talking about. In the past 15 years, broadband and mobile technologies have just continued to penetrate and permeate our lives. That new common sense has been emerging. And now the opportunity is that David and Goliath must dance. Regardless of what happened to the financial, financial markets, the new common sense has emerged and David and Goliath are dancing, which means that everything in my life, and my business, my world, can be plotted on that grid. And I would argue yours too. Because David, the digital entrepreneur, starts in the lower left-hand corner in a pit of vulnerability because it's hard to be an entrepreneur. It's terrifying, as we've heard. But David understands things. He knows things. He knows about consumer data and that it's the fuel for future businesses. He understands these digital business models and he understands that the world's gone network. But he's got to get to market. He's got a problem. He's got a customer acquisition problem. And no venture capitalist is going to give him 50 million euros to acquire 50 million customers. He's got to do a deal. So he has a choice. He can do a deal with Apple, Facebook, Google, the Android, iOS, app marketplaces based more or less in Palo Alto. Or he can stay locally, engage with his industry, with the Goliaths that are around him, the newspaper groups, the radio stations, the telcos, the retailers, the banks, the mobile telecom operators, the healthcare firms, the Goliaths in his industry locally. But again and again, Goliath underestimates David. 
Goliath, the large enterprise, whether they're family businesses or large industrial groups, they can't get their head around the idea that this scrawny little David could transform the world, that small becomes big, that startups actually change the world. And so Goliath underestimates David again and again. I'll never forget when I first started working with that relatively obscure Swedish entrepreneur, the founder of Skype, I found myself in late 2003 on a radio show. And opposite me was the CEO of an incumbent telco. And I was talking about how Skype was going to change the world. I remember he interrupted me and he scoffed and he said, you're going to lose your shirt and he's going to go bust. Ain't going to happen. And I said, this is really very interesting. You've decided to underestimate the entrepreneur who's disrupted the entire music industry with Kazaa. Let me tell you, he is so happy you're doing that. You're buying him air cover to get across the grid. Because every entrepreneur is trying hard to get across the grid to the upper right-hand corner. And he's got decisions along the way and he's got choices that he will make. And it's really just a question of who wins. If Goliath underestimates David, then David will make it across and will have the opportunity to achieve that pot of financial value that he really shouldn't because he's David, he's just a little guy. But if Goliath embraces David, if he goes to entrepreneur country and engages in a conversation about the future, then David is forced to articulate that strategic value. How do we build those new digital revenues? How does a lean operating system work? And David hops on the back of Goliath and they build a high growth business. Importantly, headquartered wherever they are. So let me tell you about an example of an entrepreneur who did just that. Monetize is a UK listed firm it's the third fastest growing business in the United Kingdom, and it's worth about a billion dollars. And I was fortunate to meet the entrepreneur about 10 years ago. He said a very basic thing at the beginning. He said, if this mobile banking is going to work, it has to work for everyone. The mobile telecoms operator and the bank have to get a cut of the revenues. And the individual needs to get a lower cost of capital compared to what they would get for, say, Western Union. Western Union will charge you 22% if you're poor. And so what the CEO of Monetize did for five years was to build a set of economics for his natural allies, for the industry and the ecosystem that he was bu building in order to get pulled into the market. He structured not just his company, but the ecosystem. And as a result today, he's buying his US competitors. He's servicing a thousand financial institutions, re-intermediating them into the industry, the banking industry. He's worth a billion dollars. He's backed by Visa five times. He's leveraging Goliath's distribution. He's the digital car on the highway. David and Goliath are dancing. Now we're gonna see these David and Goliath deals all over the planet. This is gonna be the next 30 years. David and Goliath. But there's one vision of the future whereby the technology firms just continue to take over every industry. As Amazon has taken over books and Apple has taken over music and Google has taken over advertising and you can see where this is going. But there is another future to be written. And it's kind of a fight back strategy, an insurgency if you will. And it requires Goliath even more than David to go to entrepreneur country with humility and a lot of respect. And to show up and to say, yeah, I know I'm the big guy in the industry and I dominate it, but I don't really understand these digital business models. And we don't have the right clock speed and we're kind of bad at innovating, but we can be your highway. And I have a lot of respect for how hard you work and you seem to understand the future. And if David and Goliath start having those conversations, they build a different future. This is about the P&L. This is not a balance sheet game. This is not about giving more work to the investment bankers to go sell and buy companies. This is the hard work of building business. 
This is the hard work of building new digital revenues because nine-tenths of industry has not yet been eaten by software, has not yet been transformed by business models. It's yet to happen. David and Goliath must dance and they got to get going. But why does this matter? Why should you care? Well, from Helsinki to Madrid and Dublin to Athens, over 550 million people, the best and the brightest technology entrepreneurs of that large continent called Europe, get backed by venture capitalists. And the venture capitalists have structured their industry. They're structuring their industry and they're playing a game. They back those technology startups and they're going to sell them to a U.S. technology firm. So if you didn't go to Palo Alto at the beginning, you'll go to Palo Alto at the end, unless you go to entrepreneur country. So I never forget that innovation is about disruptive economics, not disruptive technology. Otherwise, we'd be flying the Concorde. We're not. We're stuffed into jumbo jets. And I never forget that the world has gone network. It's not a function anymore of how smart I am or how hard I work or who I know. It is a function of whether or not I've identified my natural allies, whether I've engaged with them, and I've done the hard work of building the economics for my ecosystem. All industries are being transformed by digital business models, the sexy ones and the unsexy ones. And in 2013, the network benefits are accruing to the firms who understand their role in their ecosystem and organizing the economics for it. This is leading to exceptional returns for their shareholders. Don't go to Palo Alto, go to entrepreneur country. Thank you very much.